Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Good afternoon. Welcome to the MIT Faculty Forum Online. I'm Victoria Gonin, the Executive Director of Alumni Relations, and I will serve as your moderator today. Today's broadcast is sponsored in part by the MIT Federal Credit Union, MIT Professional Education, and MIT Sloan Executive Education. As a reminder, we welcome your questions during this chat. Alumni joining us via Zoom can use the question and answer feature found on your toolbar. We will get to as many questions as we can. Today's topic, new research on cannabis and its effects on the brain and behavior. Thanks to the Broderick Fund for Phytocannabinoid Research established in 2019 by our special guest, Bob Broderick, class of 1999, both Harvard and MIT will produce new research in the years to come on this topic. Today, we'll hear about research underway in two labs, one at each university from our guests, Professor John Gabrielli at the McGovern Institute at MIT and Professor Bruce Bean at Harvard Medical School. First, let's hear from the philanthropist himself, Bob Broderick. Bob, could you start by telling us how this gift came to be and what your hopes for it is in the coming decade. At the time you made yeah, your hi, gift, you. it was, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh yeah, I was gonna say thank you. Uh, and uh, to the MIT faculty forum for this online series. Um, yeah, the gift came about as a result of um, five years working in the uh, Canadian legal cannabis industry as a private investor and as a chairman of a BC licensed producer and retailer of cannabis. Um, ending prohibition there had a number of positive attributes. Uh, it provided quality control of the supply chain, uh, taxation, uh, age verification, um, social justice reform. Um, but in order to reap those benefits, the entire supply chain needed to be implemented from scratch. Uh, this required borrowing skills and um, professionals from the real world, like accounting, law, finance, uh, distribution, retail, construction, project management, PR, you know, all of the sorts of things that other industries can kind of take for granted. Um, and one of the areas that I saw was constantly underdeveloped, um, but was um, always coming up as a stumbling block in conversation. Uh, was the availability of basic research into cannabis products and their effects on the human body. Um, not just the pharmacological mechanism of action, although that too, um, but also behavioral and developmental effects. Um, most, most basic research is funded by the federal government and cannabis remains on the schedule one, um, sometimes requiring uh, uh, NIDA and DEA coordination for research. Um, so the amount of basic research was far outpaced by the business of cannabis itself, um, both legal and illegal. Um, you know, legal cannabis companies, they have large capital outlays for things like greenhouses and GMP processing facilities, but they're not big enough to earmark basic research funding. Um, so, you know, without the federal or corporate support, there was really no basic customer for the research work. Um, that's when I saw an opportunity to engage with the two research institutions that I was familiar with um, going through the alumni office and <laughs> like pitching them basically my thoughts on the industry's need to grow and develop long-term U.S. research. And they introduced me to uh, investigators uh, who were already encountering cannabinoids in their own discipline, either clinically um, or through the study of endocannabinoids like anandamide. Um, you know, curiosity is such an important part of the culture of these labs and of the research mm -hmm. university. Um, so yeah, you know, the aspirations for the fund and you know, the reason behind its multi-year framework is to seed US basic research sector for cannabis for some time. Um, I wanna encourage young scientists and principal researchers to think about the area and give them, you know, the space and the breathing room to do it. I'm not looking for any particular or specific finding or result. It's, it's philanthropic, right? So it's, it's, it's supposed to advocate for the urgency of the results, um, that there are important questions here to answer. 
And, you know, as an aside, I think you can really showcase the skill of these particular specialties within Harvard and MIT. Um, there's a very high level of capability in the facilities and the mines there, um, which is good because, you know, U.S. cannabis regulation is hugely decentralized. There's multi layers of bureaucracy. And, and that means there's a lot of people writing regulations separate and apart from each other. These are the people who could really most benefit from philanthropic support of national and university level research. And, you know, the idea is hopefully as our learning about cannabis and their products evolve, so too will the regulations evolve, um, in particular in the areas of form factor, dosage, concentra concentrates, effects claims, age restrictions. Um, I think, you know, if the coronavirus circumstance informs anything here, it's a recognition of how important it is to have government policy be influenced by reliable basic research. And, you know, all of that is supportive of the industry, ultimately the consumer. Thank you. And at, at the time when you made your gift, it was thought to be the largest ever made for basic cannabis research. In one interview, you said it probably wouldn't last for long. So a year later, are you right? Are you right? Um, I, I do believe that people's opinions about the normalization of cannabis as a part of everyday life have moderated, you know, not everyone's. I mean, it was only a few years that ago that the CEO of the largest U.S. producer of cannabis had to call up prospective executives' parents to assure them that their child was not going to work for some kind of illegal drug cabal. But um, you know, in the fall, in the U.S. Senate, there were cannabis hearings that were attended by the U.S. Surgeon General and the NIDA director. And if there's one common ground across the board in that room, it was the need to fund and streamline approvals for cannabis research. So that makes it a really good place to push from. Um, what we're seeing now in philanthropic giving is large foundations carving out parts of their budget for cannabis research, um, as opposed to like individuals like myself. But in my mind, all of this early money is primarily jockeying for position for when the US federal money starts to flow uh, and putting the right people, procedures, areas of inquiry and equipment in place to make the best use of it. Great, great. So let's hear from some of our researchers now. First, we'll hear from Bruce Bean from Harvard Medical School, and then we'll hear from John Gabrielli from MIT. Um, can you, Bruce, can you share some of the projects supported by this funding that are underway right now in your labs? I will, actually. Yeah, I'll show a, I'll show a slide uh, that uh, shows uh, some of the projects uh, in just a second. Um, you know, we, this was incredibly timely because the neurobiology of cannabis is really, as Bob said, an understudied area. Um, you know, it's, uh, we know that cannabis has effects on the brain, of course, but exactly what those are and uh, how cannabinoid receptors and how the cannabinoids uh, in cannabis itself interact with the brain is really poorly understood in relation to, for example, other neurotransmitter systems. Um, and a lot of us had sort of a general interest in it, but it's something that's not so easy to get uh, NIH uh, grant support for, uh, for a number of reasons. And so, you know, this, um, uh, this uh, initiative that Bob started has really been fantastic because it brought out a lot of interest in a lot of labs um, at Harvard Medical School and also the affiliated hospitals, you know, as you'll see. Uh, and that also brought a lot of us together, particularly, you know, people in the neurobiology department at Harvard Medical School and people working in neurobiology at the various hospitals. So uh, it's already been been just fantastic, and um, you know we're all uh, unfortunately you know just sort of all ready to go. Um, and I, you know, hopefully in a month or so we'll really be able to get the experiment started. We've actually started a few, which I'll show. So I thought I would start with um, just giving a little background, uh, a very quick background on the neurobiology of cannabis, what we know about it, what we don't know about it, uh, and the. Um, you know, what, what we've learned is that, uh, uh, oops, let's see, let me be sure to share my screen here. So what we've learned is that, uh, that the uh, cannabinoids interact with specific, uh, with specific 
uh, receptors uh, in the brain. Uh, and the, 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 there's an endocannabinoid system. So the cannabinoids in cannabis uh, interact with receptors that already respond to natural transmitters called endocannabinoids, which are generated by neurons and by glial cells in the brain. And the dominant one of these endocannabinoids is 2-arachidonyl glycerol. It's a lipid-based molecule. It's kind of hard to study because uh, the biochemistry of lipids are kind of complicated. And the essential thing that it does is it's released by postsynaptic neurons. It diffuses through the membrane of the postsynaptic neuron back to the presynaptic neuron mostly operates on a specific receptor called the CB1 receptor that's mostly on the presynaptic membrane. And then that modulates synaptic transmission from the presynaptic cell to the postsynaptic cell. Now it gets complicated because these receptors are both on excitatory synapses uh, mediated by glutamate and on inhibitory synapses mediated by GABA. And they are almost ubiquitous in neurons in the brain. So they control synaptic transmission over many, many brain regions. And understanding exactly how they modify the circuitry you know, is something that, that we have just have a huge amount of work to do on, both, both at the level of uh, the cellular level, and then as John will talk about it, on, on the level of how the whole brain works. In the case of the phytocannabinoids, the cannabinoids in, uh, in cannabis, those have very different structures than the endocannabinoids, but in general, they interact with the same receptors. So uh, how that evolved, we don't really know. Uh, these are the structures of the dominant endocannabinoids. These are the structures of uh, actually only some of the molecules in cannabis sativa uh, that interact with the receptor. There's uh, lots of them. And that right away is something that's incredibly important because it means that naturally occurring cannabis has not just one. So the one that's most famous is Delta 9 THC. That's the uh, uh, dominant cannabinoid that interacts with receptors, the CB1 receptors and produces the psychoactive effects. But there are a lot of other cannabinoids, including, for example, probably the second most famous one now is cannabidiol, CBD, which interestingly does not interact with those receptors. So understanding how cannabis itself interacts with the system is, is very, very complicated. And that's something a lot of the research is, is oriented at. So uh, in, uh, in uh, figuring out how to use uh, Bob's very generous gift, we put together a, a, a panel and called for proposals from people, um, uh, including the, the Harvard Associated Hospitals, and uh, reviewed the various uh, proposals. And these are the ones that were funded for the initial round. Um, and you can see the research uh, goes from research in my lab, which is really at the level of individual neurons, um, to research on uh, cannabis exposure during, during development. Um, control of neural circuits, controlling anxiety and sleep. And then Stacy Gruber at McLean, uh, who's an expert in the behavioral effects of cannabis, has been very interested in trying to understand uh, how the full spectrum cannabinoids in cannabis differ from single components like THC uh, in, in producing cognitive and, and behavioral effects on, uh, with human volunteers. And we're also funding, we thought it would be good to fund postdoctoral fellows who are interested in this um, because there, you know, the impact can be really fantastic. If a postdoctoral fellow uh, is supported and gets interested in this area, they might stay interested in it and work on it for their entire career. And we had very good responses uh, there. And so we have three postdoctoral fellows who are looking at um, both uh, molecular level uh, uh, understanding cannabinoid receptors and uh, the role of phytocannabinoids in pain, for example. So we're very excited about all of these. Uh, we're starting to uh, uh, all work together. I thought I'd uh, talk just very briefly about the work in my lab, which is on CBD, cannabidiol. Uh, this is uh, from the uh, cover of the New York Times Magazine from last year on this sort of explosion of interest in CBD. 
Uh, now, the interesting thing about it is that we, we, you know, we actually don't have good clinical data for most of these uh, sort of uh, reported effects. But the most interesting thing about CBD is that uh, it has now been approved for clinical use by the FDA in epilepsy um, in work done by Oren Devensky at NYU and Elizabeth Thiel uh, uh, at Harvard and, and Mass General. And what's very interesting about CBD is that this is, I think, almost unprecedented in modern pharmacology in that it was, uh, came from experiments done by parents uh, who had epileptic kids um, who got CBD um, and used it and found that it was effective. And some of those parents eventually uh, talked with Oren Devensky and other pediatric neurologists like Elizabeth, um, who then put together clinical studies and showed that, in fact, it is clinically effective in at least some forms of childhood epilepsy that are resistant to other drug treatments. So it's really been a huge success um, and uh, is, you know, I think certainly the first cannabinoid that's been approved uh, as a prescription drug. We don't know exactly how it works on epilepsy. That's one of the things we're working on in my lab. We find that it has direct effects on the sodium channels that underlie the basic uh, ele electrophysiological excitability of neurons. And so we think that that's probably you know, a very fundamental aspect of how it inhibits epileptic activity, but we still don't understand that completely. The other thing we've been interested in is, is uh, following up. There's a lot of anecdotal statements by people that they find CBD useful for pain. And so we've started to look at it on, on pain sensing neurons uh, primary pain sensing neurons, and we find that it's remarkably effective in inhibiting excitability of those neurons at fairly low concentrations. And in fact, it's more effective, uh, more potent than local anesthetics that lidocaine are if you put it directly onto these. So these are things we'll be all be following up in the, in the future, and uh, we're really very excited about this initiative. Thank you. That's great. Um... Professor Gabrielli. So my slides appear okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Well, I want to express a huge appreciation uh, to, to Bob Bodrick, who, who made you know, this research possible. It makes such a big difference in this field because as all of you know, uh, throughout North America and other nations, we're having this huge shift in public policy and kind of an uncontrolled experiment in certain senses of where are the benefits, where are the risks. Uh, and and, and uh, Bob Bodrick has really given a free hand to the scientists at Harvard and MIT to make real scientific progress in this. And as Bruce said in his uh, wonderful scientific introduction, the scientific knowledge is far behind public interest, public use, uh, and the concerns of all kinds of people who might uh, benefit from the components of uh, cannabidiols. So uh, I'm one of four investigators at MIT who have been uh, supported by this project. We too have graduate students and postdoctoral fellows involved in this research. So uh, as Bruce underlined, uh, you know, we're training the next generation of scientists who will be uh, going to other universities and training their own trainees and, and, and growing this in terms of thinking about the future and, and how we can see a positive, safe, healthy future for so many people. Um, so I'm going to touch on projects. Uh, almost everything we began uh, stopped, uh, you know, just as we were about to get to uh, the critical uh, sort of data collection moments. Uh, human research, like animal research, has stopped. Um, but uh, as soon as uh, it's safe to do it again, we're prepared to go with amazing collaborators. And so we wanted to express, study four topics uh, in parallel. First, can cannabinoids enhance cognition and schizophrenia? We have a little bit of data that it does. We want to understand it more deeply. Uh, can it reduce anxiety? And we're going to look at patients specifically with social anxiety disorder. But I think the lesson from that might spread not only to patients with generalized anxiety, but also individuals with autism frequently have anxiety as a, as a symptom. So that's a big topic. Another one uh, that Bruce mentioned was chronic pain. So we have collaborators. I'll show you my one data point. Uh, so far, uh, who, with, who have been studying uh, the mechanism for that via positron emission tomography, the reduction of pain. And then uh, all, all these three are, are about hopeful beneficial uses, but we also know that society has to worry about, you know, uses that are not entirely beneficial. 
And so we're also thinking about understanding better the risk of cannabinoid use in adolescents, because that's the one spot, I think, if anything, where there's been convergent uh, correlational evidence for risk that we need to understand more as a society, and I'll say it as a parent as well. So um, uh, a really striking result, but well supported by a number of findings, is that patients with chronic schizophrenia can sometimes improve their cognition through the use of uh, THC, uh, the, 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 the sort of psychoactive component of, of marijuana. And uh, although it's counterintuitive, the evidence is, is pretty good. Um, and my collaborator, uh, and I will say a uh, conflict of interest, my, my wife, uh, Susan Whitfield Gabrielli, who's now a professor at Northeastern University, in case you're worried, we're still happily together. Um, but uh, 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 she was involved in a study with Alan Green at Dartmouth uh, that, that reported that giving THC to patients with schizophrenia normalized some of their brain functions and improved their working memory or cognition, which is a topic that's been really hard in schizophrenia. Antipsychotic medications can help patients avoid the sort of uh, uh, delusions they have or hallucinations, but it's been hard to help patients with chronic schizophrenia gain the kind of cognitive skills that would make their everyday life better. And here's a sort of an opening. And so in, with Alan Green, we're collaborating to find what is an optimal blend of marijuana constituents, specifically CBD and THC, that might you know, help these patients really improve their cognition and hopefully that would make it easier for them to steer their, their way through their many years uh, when they're not suffering uh, fr from the acute psychosis of schizophrenia. So that's one study that's underway. A second study is, is uh, mo mo motivated by uh, uh, a number of things, but there've been four published studies, pretty small studies. The, the, they all reported that an acute dose of CBD reduces feelings of stress in people without a diagnosis and reduces stress in patients with social anxiety disorder, a particular version of uh, anxiety. Um, and this is, this is uh, some of the evidence that points to the idea that CBD may be a good anxiolytic. Now you can walk down the aisle in my supermarket and see endless CBD products and uh, famous sports figures uh, endorsing them. Um, but the range of quality evidence about what CBD can do for people, what's the right circumstance, who benefits from it, is very minimal, but very encouraging as far as it's gone. Um, so we like to, we're collaborating with Stefan Hoffman at Boston University. They have one of the world leading centers for cognitive behavioral therapy for anxiety. It's a top research center. We've collaborated with them before. And we're gonna do two projects in collaboration that are, are, are well set up to go as soon as we're back in, in action. Uh, one of them is to, if we're going to examine the acute effects of CBD on brain function. And then second, we're going to ask this question for cognitive behavioral therapy, which helps patients with anxiety. Only about half of patients have a strong response. A really interesting idea is whether an, an acute uh, dose of CBD just before each of the therapeutic sessions might strengthen the effectiveness of those sessions and improve the outcomes for more patients. So combining CBD with behavioral supports. Uh, and both of these studies will be run in a randomized, uh, RCT randomized controlled trial. So we'll have a uh, you know, double blind. The examiners won't know who has CBD versus a placebo. Uh, the, the patients won't know. And so we're gonna run in a very rigorous FDA style science because that's what we have the opportunity to do now. Um, and, and discover whether the, and, and another community that's very interested in this and we're talking with you know, it there too, are patients with autism or parents of children with autism where anxiety is so prevalent, you know, would CBD be a boost for those children and for those adults? Uh, and so we're investigating that. So well-controlled studies to ask whether CBD is, a, is an effective and helpful um, and safe uh, anxiolytic reduction of anxiety. And in, in for people with many, there's many people with anxiety. The next study is, is our one data point before everything stopped on us uh, in terms of uh, that I can share with you, but it's a collaboration with Eden Evans and Jody Gilman at Mass General Hospital to ask whether CBD uh, uh, reduces chronic pain and the mechanism of that reduction in the brain. Here's an individual patient who received CBD uh, for four weeks. Uh, their pain rating goes down. They have less pain that they're feeling or suffering from. Uh, and the reduced signal that you can see in the picture is evidence for reduced uh, inflammation in the pro inflammation in the brain. So it's a it's one it's it's 
less than an anecdote. Uh, it's a single observation, but uh, you know, it's a, it's a striving to look at this carefully and to understand the neural mechanisms associated with, with benefits for, for patients. And lastly, if there's one area I think where there's reason for uh, a caution, about the use of cannabinoids, it's with uh, adolescents. Uh, it's the same caution we have about, in some ways, about you know driving age or use of alcohol. Uh, there's a you know, there's many issues in brain development that we're uh, want to be careful about. Um, and, and there have been several correlational studies uh, su suggesting um, a link between the intensive use of marijuana and uh, cognitive and mental health problems. Of course, in these correlational studies you never know what's the cause and what's the effect. You know, are people doing something to help themselves with a difficulty they have to start with? We don't know that, we don't know that relationship at all. And nor are we honestly likely to do that. Uh, I don't, you know, we're not likely to do an experiment where we randomly assign a group of high school students to uh, start smoking a lot of marijuana and others not to, who haven't done before. I mean, it's ethically impossible to do the hardcore science study. But we can try to tune ourselves a little bit to understand uh, you know, what, what the risk profile is and thinking about that. Um, and so we have a collaboration with Randy Schuster and Eden Evans and MGH. And here's a study they did that they published, and here's our follow-up. Uh, they asked uh, persistent users of marijuana, high school students, to voluntarily be abstinent for a month. Um, and the, the one month number comes in because that's about how long it takes for them to be able to give in a test to see whether they've really been abstinent. And then they tracked uh, their cognitive performance in that month. What is the benefits for these, these students for uh, being abstinent for marijuana use? They gave several tests of cognition. Most of them did not change. There was an, import, there was an improvement in verbal memory. So it, it's something, it, um, it wasn't a broad uh, benefit for stopping from these students within this context of the study, but there was a specific observation. So this group has a new study underway that supported uh, already. Uh, and we're working with them on the brain imaging side of it to understand you know, what, what one sees in terms of abstinence. Um, and we're coll collaborating with a new uh, addiction research in initiative at the McGovern Institute for Brain Research to, to, to think both sides of this. We both want to understand the benefits, how can we really encourage them, understand them scientifically and rigorously understand the mechanism of them in many individuals, but also be savvy about potential risks for, it, for some individuals. And so uh, we're, we're grateful that we have the opportunity to look at the potential benefits in a rigorous scientific way, and also to raise caution where caution is, is, is advised. So, uh, we're very grateful for this opportunity. Uh, I should say the other researchers at, at, at MIT who receive support for this are all uh, wet lab animal researchers, uh, uh, basic researchers. We're, we're the only group that's working uh, directly with, with, with humans in the patient population. And we're very grateful for this opportunity. Uh, without this, really, I think it would have taken many years of tiny research steps to get to where we're allowed to be through this gift. And we're, we're grateful for this chance to move forward. Great, thank you. Thanks, both of you. So let's hear from our attendees now. We have a lot of questions coming in. And I'd like to remind the alumni viewers to ask your questions of the, our guests today using the question and answer feature in Zoom. And even if you're not asking a question yourself, please help us filter the questions you'd like to hear discussed by using the thumbs up feature. So let's get to some of these questions. Um, first question, there have been case reports of people suffering from long-term cognitive determinants, depression, anxiety, depersonalization, as a result of using cannabis. Have we learned anything about the underlying mechanisms which may be causing this? So I would say, um, so let me start with, I'm not a physician, so I'm gonna be cautious in my answer on this. I, I try to keep up with the literature on this. Um, I, I mean, there have been brain imaging studies, but you know, these, they're all so correlational in, in people with complex situations that it's hard to know what the scientific lesson is or, or the societal use lesson is or, or because, um, uh, you know, which is driving which? Is a, is a difficulty driving um, excessive use of, of marijuana? So, I, you know, I, we have to be very cautious, but, I, uh, uh, but we just, it's just not clear scientific evidence, you know, uh, um, and so uh, 
uh, and it's impossible to do that. So we'll have to collect data over time. I think the more we understand mechanisms where we're allowed to probe it, you know, uh, uh, the more we might have candidate mechanisms to think about. Um, but it is important to be cautious because, uh, you know, uh, the, as with so many things, there are vulnerable populations uh, within society that, you know, it's not the same experience for, for people with, with um, uh, it's the same thing with, to a certain extent that we're seeing with COVID, right? There's vulnerabilities that make it much more risky and those need to be identified. And there's for other people, it's not as risky and, and the benefits might, there's no benefits of COVID, but uh, the benefits uh, of something like CBD in terms of uh, pain reduction, anxiety reduction, uh, you know, might, might be very substantial. Mm -hmm. Great. Next question, is there any evidence to suggest that the use of cannabis may retard or accelerate the onset of dementia or Alzheimer's? I have not heard of any evidence of that. Now, again, I'm sorry, this is, we're going all over areas I'm not expert in, so I'm taking my chances on this. Um, I have not heard that. Um, again, I'll, I'll just say it's very hard unless something is very striking, you know, to, to see causative factors for Alzheimer's, but I've not heard any strong evidence in that regard at all. Okay. Um, what is an acute dose of CBD? Acute dose in quotes. Yes, yeah, sorry. So I just, I, I did, yeah, thank you for me making me speak English, um, um, uh, it, we just mean a single dose. So, uh, you know, often we think about, uh, say in a medical treatment, a chronic treatment, taking CBD, for example, you know, so, you know once a day or something like that, uh, or multiple times. Acute just means what is the effect of a single dose of CBD? Uh, and then that's all we mean by that. Okay. Has there been further research into the paradoxical effects of CBD THC on autistic individuals when compared to neurotypical individuals? Uh, I, 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 get, I, I feel bad that I don't know more on answering that question. I, 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 uh, I know people will say, like, can't we have the speaker from Caltech or something? Who, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, 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 I, I'm sorry, I, I, I do know that, that there was a study from Israel, you know, where, where families have been using um, um, uh, mm -hmm. CBD and reporting in a non-controlled way, observational benefits. So, uh, uh, but I, I, I don't know more than that, I'm sorry to say. Okay. People are curious. This is good. Um, recent research suggests biological basis for the sex differences in schizophrenia. Is there a sex difference in reactions to cannabinoids? Benoids? Wow, these are, I have to say, these are all great questions, and almost all of them are making me have to do homework after this session. And I'm sorry I don't know them <laughs> as, as well as I might. You see, the samples of, of, of participants who have been in uh, research studies looking at this have been very small. So mm -hmm. if there is a sex difference, it, it would not be evident in, in those sample mm -hmm. sizes. Um, mm -hmm. So again, I've not heard people emphasize that. Doesn't mean it's not there, um, but the small samples in the published studies, uh, uh, you know, as Bob described, there's so many obstacles to performing this Perfect. research for so many years that almost everything published with humans has been either kind of observational, correlational, or very small experiments. You have been well conducted with control conditions, but they've been very small in the number of participants. It's been a, so it's a very thin uh, basis of evidence for almost all these. Mm -hmm. And this is part of the, if I can jump in, this is part of the problem. When I said that like the lack of basic research comes into stumbling blocks into conversations, this is exactly what I mean. These are very sort of straightforward, simple questions that somebody might ask. And uh, the answer is like, Okay, so now how do we go about addressing this problem? And mm -hmm. so that's what I'm hoping that the researchers can start helping us go down that mm -hmm. path. Mm -hmm. These are good questions. If used as a painkiller, which component of cannabis oil is better, CBD or THC? I, you know, I think that, that again, it's a great question. Um, there is, as far as I'm quite sure, you know, no clear data on that in well-controlled studies. Um, so there is, anecdotally, you know, certainly there are a lot of people who use CBD for pain. Um, uh, again, the, you know, the, the studies on that, I would say, are not 
controlled well enough in particular kinds of pain and so forth to have a clear answer. In pain research in general, which I've worked on for a bit, it's, been very, it's a very difficult uh, area to do clinical studies in because there's a very large and a very real placebo effect. So that you know, even um, something like morphine that inhibits pain very effectively, it's actually not so easy to get very clear clinical data with it uh, because you need so many patients um, because of the variability of patients and because of a large placebo effect. And the placebo effect doesn't mean you know, that something doesn't work. It, that's just, it's, it's a very real biological phenomenon. My impression, you know, myself in looking at uh, the, uh, exper the, the published data with THC and CBD is that um, it's hard to tell. Um, and there are, you know, certainly anecdotes that mixing them together can be more effective than, than, than individually. But again, I would say it's really at the level of, of anecdotes at this point, as far as I can tell. Is there any research on the effects of cannabinoids on the spinal cord sodium cha channels? Uh, there, uh, yes, actually, there, there, there is. Um, we know the spinal, in the spinal cord, there are multiple sodium channels. And uh, there is very recent research showing that CBD, and uh, I would say, well, we're, we're looking at THC also, but CBD definitely has direct effects on sodium channels, including those in the spinal cord. That's if you look at the effect you know, on a single cell. The big issue that we're finding in, in the effect of CBD in an animal is that the pharmacokinetics are very complicated because so if you, you know, eat a certain amount of CBD in an edible or something like that, there's only a fraction of it, actually a relatively small fraction that ends up getting through your digestive system uh, and into the bloodstream. And then because it's a very lipid solub soluble molecule and because our bodies are full of lipids, you know, all our cells are surrounded by lipid membranes, uh, the, the uh, THC uh, and, and CBD um, end up at concentrations in our tissue that are very hard to measure accurately, you know. Mm -hmm. And so uh, how much actually ends up getting to the sodium channel on a neuron is a very important question that we have to do fundamental research to answer. Is there any research on cannabis and IQ? So um, th 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 there's one study, for example, uh, that from a famous longitudinal study in New Zealand that reported uh, uh, individuals who use CBT uh, as they developed lost, statistically lost some IQ points over time. So this is one of the reasons we worry about children um, and, and adolescents in this regard. At the same time, um, you know, these kinds of correlational studies are, are just always, they're, they're, they're signals, we should pay attention to them. Um, sometimes we'd just rather have our five-year-old be safe than worry about, you know, <laughs> in pure, in pure, you know, complete scientific evidence. Um, but uh, it, it, these things are so complicated. I mean, there's a reason why, which we don't know really, why somebody might uh, use an excessive and prolonged amount of, of marijuana. Okay? And is that, is that independent of other factors that develop IQ? Is that linked, or do they share some common psychological or neural mechanism over time? Um, we just don't know the answer to these things. So, you know, there, I, I think there's a difference between scientific knowledge about these things and saying, well, for some things where there's smoke, you know, we'll be a little protective. Uh, and again, I think that applies to children and adolescents as well at the moment. But, you know, I, I think that uh, parents feel that way, society feels that way for so many things that we want to be protective uh, until people have the capacity to make adult decisions and have passed through a sort of maturation of their brain. Uh, you know, um, at the same time, I'll say that some parents have reported that CBD really help their child with autism uh, be, be less anxious. So, so we just have to be cautious and very uh, careful about, I think, the pediatric element of the story. Uh, but we just don't know in any causal way uh, what the linkage is between IQ and, and any version of marijuana or constituent of marijuana. Mm -hmm. 
These questions keep coming in. Will Dr. Stacy Gruber's research on full spectrum versus isolated cannabinoids seek to clarify why isolated cannabinoids produce a bell curve shaped dose response, whereas full spectrum cannabis produces a dose dependent interaction? That's certainly the kind of question that her research is, is aimed at specifically. And, um, you know, I think it's very important. She uh, has been very frustrated in her research because um, she has, uh, you know, until now, and, and I'm, not, I'm not even sure it's really changed quite yet, until now she's been limited in the approved studies that she can do to a specific uh, form of cannabis, you know, from a specific farm in Mississippi that the federal government supplies. And what she has said is that she works with, um, you know, volunteers who come in and who have a lot of experience with marijuana often, uh, and who say that what she's giving them is absolutely nothing like what, what they are used to uh, using. And um, so, you know, you can do experiments and find that the mixture of various components is very different in different strains of marijuana. That's something that's completely well known to, you know, from what I hear uh, from users. And, um, and then, you know, understanding uh, what those components are and what the interaction of those components are, you know, is really sort of a fundamental thing that, that her, that's exactly what she wants to learn. Mm -hmm. Good, thanks. Apart from the effects of cannabinoids in adolescence, the study of effects of the combined use of cannabis and alcohol is important since it's a widespread spread practice. Any thoughts there? No, I have to say these questions are all great. They're all important. Um, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it, uh, you know I, I, we're so far behind where we want to be. But it's you know probably you know you know Bruce mentioned that NIH restricted research to a form of, of marijuana that is so much weaker than anybody gets at a store in Massachusetts. <laughs> that it's it's confusing how to think about that. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and you know and then see the CBD products you see all over the place. Um, it was only in the last couple of years that there's been a pharmaceutical grade CBD available from a pharmaceutical company where you can have some confidence. Uh, you know uh, that it's you're looking at a, what the dose is, the effective dose. So, so many things from before are, are based on, you know, very things that are almost irrelevant uh, to, you know, the real effects of CBD or the real effects of THC and so on, uh, mm -hmm. due to, you know, th th there are practical, that are happening outside of research and that, that could be a beneficial uh, value in, in research and for patient populations. And, you know, in the industry, we've noticed in places where cannabis has been legalized or made more widely available to the population, the alcohol consumption in those areas has fallen. I'm not sure what that suggests or means, but it's, it's an effect that we've been observing. Mm, interesting. All right, so last question. Given the research obstacles in the US, have any of today's researchers reached out to potential collaborators in the Canadian universities or other, those in other countries? I can say, we, we have not specifically be, you know, partly because, um, you know, even if we were to collaborate with somebody in Canada, uh, anything we do has to be approved by, you know, our local committees and so forth. Um, I think it's an interesting idea. Uh, I, I'm not sure for, for actually for research, um, uh, for research use of you know, the, the frustrating thing in the U.S. now is that I can go two blocks away and buy cannabis, but I can't, I have to use a Schedule One license, you know, through my department to actually get something to do research with it. So it's a little bit easier now than it has been, but it's still difficult. I'll bet it's not that much easier in Canada, although I don't know, I don't know specifically about that. So I have one last question, because I think perhaps we might all benefit from the answer on this. Has there been any work done on cannabis for improving sleep? Uh, 
you know, again, you know, from my reading of the literature, there's a lot of anecdotal um, uh, statements that it helps people with sleep. I, I have to admit, you know, one of the first times I heard about CBD was from my wife when she went to visit a friend in California and came back with um, CBD uh, uh, and uh, started taking it because she, you know, sometimes wakes up at night. And I have to say, I was kind of convinced that it worked. I think she was also, but you know, complete anecdote. Um, mm -hmm. So how, how does it work? That's actually one of the proposals that, that Todd Anthony at Children's Hospital uh, is gonna be working on because I would say that's, to me, that's a case sort of like the epilepsy where um, mm -hmm. you hear it from so many people that it's a little hard to believe that there isn't you know, a biological basis to it, but it needs to be studied. Great. Thank you both. I felt like today was stump the professor. <laughs> um, but thank you both. Bob, do you have any closing thoughts or comments after hearing all those great questions? No, nope, I just I can't wait for uh, to find out the results of a lot of these studies. I think it's really going to help everybody uh, make more informed decisions. Good. Um, we will um, leave this open, this chat open for till the hour, till four o'clock. And we are collecting all these questions, which we will send to the panelists. So on behalf of the Alumni Association, thank you for tuning in to the Faculty Forum online. And thank you again, Bob and Professor Gabrielli and Professor Bean for joining us today. Um, and again, we'll be sure to forward all your questions that were not addressed on the air to the panelists. Um, and this broadcast will be made available live on MIT Alumni Association YouTube within about a week from today. So thank you again all for watching today. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Bob, for the gift. Really thank, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.